Uh, Paul Spudis is a senior staff scientist at the Luna and Planetary Institute, just across Clear Lake, where he studies impact processes and volcanism on the moon and terrestrial planets. Paul was a principal investigator of the, ra uh, he was the principal investigator of the radar experiment on the Indian Chandrayaan-1 mission to the moon. Um, that was in 2008, 2009. And he is a team member on a similar experiment, the Mini-RF, currently orbiting the moon on NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft. Thank you, Louise. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the new things we found out about the moon in the last few years. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, it's, it's actually turned out to be surprising in, many sen in, in one way, and that is we now know that the moon will enable us to get a permanent foothold off planet. And why should we even consider the moon? Why is it important in a, in a broader context of space exploration and, and use? I think there's three principal reasons. It's close, it's interesting, and it's useful. The closeness results from the fact that the moon orbits the Earth, so it's constantly accessible. It only takes three or four days to get there, and uh, you're able to uh, uh, not only to get to it, but also to get from it. So if you need to come back home quickly, you can get home quickly. But more interestingly, it's basically a three light second round trip from the Earth, which means that we can control machines on the moon in near real time, which allows you to establish a significant presence with robotic assets before people ever go. It's interesting in that it's a miniature laboratory of planetary science. It actually displays all of the processes that work on the terrestrial planets, impact, volcanism, deformation, which is tectonism, the, the physical, mechanical deformation of the crust, all these processes can be studied on the moon, and because the moon is very ancient, it retains a record of things that have happened in this part of the solar system for the last four billion years that we can recover. And in that sense, it complements the geological record of the Earth. And finally, and most surprisingly, it's useful. It's useful because it has materials and energy that we can access and use to create new capabilities in space. So we've had an amazing set of missions in the past decade or so going to the moon, an international fleet of spacecraft have gone there to do a variety of different things. We've had orbiters, we've had landers, we've had impactors, and we've learned quite a bit about the moon in consequence of that. These are just some of the missions that have gone there. Uh, I've been involved in two of them. Uh, the Indian at the bottom left is the Chandrayaan-1 mission, which was India's first deep space mission launched in 2008, and I had a radar instrument on that that mapped the poles of the moon with imaging radar. And we had a similar instrument on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which was launched in 2009, and in fact orbits the moon to this day, and is sending back very good data to this day. So we found some amazingly spectacular landscapes in our exploration of the moon. It, it, when you look at it from a distance, you have uh, this impression of kind of a cratered body of uniform appearance. But in detail, it displays quite a lot of fascinating geological variability and, and interesting uh, things that we didn't quite expect. Uh, for example, in the bottom left, you see a pit, which is actually the opening to an underground cave on the moon. We knew that the moon had lava tubes and channels. What we did not know was that there were actually area, places on the moon that are intact where we can still access the subsurface. Uh, in the mid bottom middle is Hadley Rill, which is one of the landing sites of the Apollo missions, Apollo 15. And if you look at the very top of that frame, you see part of Hadley Rill is roofed over. So it's conceivable that there's still part of a very buried void, even associated with a rill, that we actually went to. So we didn't see this, but we know now that it's possible that it exists. The bottom right shows the Apollo 17 landing site. Uh, the, the, in the little inset diagram is the descent stage of the lunar module. That occurred 45 years ago last month. Now, one of the interesting things we found, we knew what the orientation and the physical properties of the moon were. What we didn't know is how that affected the lunar environment, or we didn't appreciate the significance of it. And this all stems from the obliquity of the moon's spin axis, which is inclined about a degree and a half from a perpendicular to the ecliptic. Now, as a result of that, that means that the sun at the poles is always near the horizon. Uh, as the moon slowly rotates, and it rotates on its axis once every 708 hours, you would see the, the sun on or slightly above or slightly below the horizon of the moon over the course of that time. Now, if you're in a hole, you might never see the sun, but conversely, if you're in a peak, you might see the sun all the time. And this, in fact, is what's made the poles so interesting. The dark areas are extremely cold. They only get heat from the interior of the moon and from the three Kelvin background radiation of space. 
And in consequence, they have temperatures as low as 25 Kelvin. Uh, so any water molecule that gets into a dark area in the, co uh, the poles of the moon is permanently trapped or sequestered there. And anything lower than 100 Kelvin, basically ice is stable on the lunar surface. So we thought there might be ice there. We weren't sure, but we thought that it was certainly physically possible. The other interesting thing is the, are the peaks that are actually stick up into the sunlight. We f if these allow you to generate uh, electrical power all the time, at the equator, you have 14 days of daylight and 14 days of nighttime. At the poles, you can generate electrical power constantly and effectively remain on the lunar surface permanently. And this is what the big discovery of the poles were. Now, finding the water was an interesting task. We used a variety of different techniques. Each technique tells you something a little bit different. The graph at the top left is the spectra from the L-cross impact. L-cross slammed the upper stage centaur of the LRO launch vehicle into the moon into a dark area, the floor of the crater Cabeus. And what we found was that the ejecta plume that, that, that was a result of that impact contained both water vapor and water ice particles at an abundance of about seven weight percent uh, water. In addition, we found by mapping the moon with spectral data that there is a strong water absorption on the moon, starting at about 60 degrees latitude and increasing in strength poleward. Now, we initially thought this was just a reflection of the cooler temperatures at the pole, but in fact, it's, uh, what it means is it allows water molecules that are being formed on the lunar surface. And the way they form is you have solar wind protons that with heat of micrometeorite impact reduce metal oxides in the soil, making native iron and making OH and H2O molecules. And these things stick to the surface. And as this, the day-night cycle occurs, the surface ultimately heats and cools and these things migrate toward the pole. Finally, we have both neutron spectrometer data and radar data that suggest ice occurs in these permanently dark areas. The neutron data suggests that the whole entire polar area is enriched in hydrogen. The radar data shows highly reflective water-like material that occurs in some of these permanently dark craters. Now, water is an extremely useful substance in space. It can support human life as a consumable. You can obviously drink it, but you can also crack it into its component gases and use the oxygen to breathe. It's a mechanism for energy storage in the sense that during this, when the sun's out, you can uh, generate your electrical power with a solar array when it's at nighttime and then crack water into its component gases. And at night, you can combine these gases in a fuel cell to generate electricity. So it's a medium of energy storage. It's a superb radiation shield. So you can jacket your habitats or your spacecraft in water and protect yourself from galactic cosmic rays and solar particle events. And finally, it's the most powerful chemical rocket propellant we know of. It, in fact, it has the highest energy and cryogenic uh, uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fuel the space shuttle main engine. So think of it for a minute about how we approach the problem of spaceflight. Fundamentally, we, we design a spacecraft. It's custom built. It's fitted to a launch vehicle. It conducts its mission, whether it's to take data, whether it's to return some piece of information, and then effectively it's abandoned. And we go back to square one and repeat that cycle all again. Well, suppose instead you could build a space transportation system out of incremental building blocks and only get from space the high mass, low information density things like consumables and propellant. And that's the real significance of water on the moon. You can use that water on the moon to generate new spaceflight capability because a, a fully fueled, for example, a fully fueled Mars spacecraft, 80% of that, 80% of the mass of that is propellant. It's the rocket equation. So why not get the most massive material you can from a source that's already in Earth orbit rather than dragging it up from the deep gravity well of the Earth? And that's sort of illustrated by this. The moon occupies a position that's very nicely placed above the deep gravity well of the Earth. So you only would launch high information density, things like electronics and people from the surface of the Earth, and get your dumb, low information density mass from objects in space like the moon. So this is what I like to call a, a plan for a, how to establish an outpost on the moon in five easy steps. And I'm taking advantage of the fact that the moon is close and that we can actually control machines remotely f with operators on the Earth on the moon. So phase one, you want to find exactly where the water occurs and where the permanent sunlit areas are. And we've already started this phase, in fact. Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter showed us where the illuminated peaks are. We have a good idea of where the best locations for the ice are. 
what we need to do now is to go down to the surface and characterize in detail. We need to know what the physical properties are, what the geotechnical properties are, and how difficult it is to access this and process it to extract the water. Once the water is extracted, then you can do a lot of different things with it. You can either use it directly to support uh, a lunar outpost, or you can be begin to crack it into its component gases and then cryogenically freeze them in the rocket propellant. In phase two, once you've established that the stuff is there and you know how to get to it, the robots actually start to begin to harvest and process the water. The interesting thing about being located at the poles is, is you can use the shadowed areas as storage. Once you've made, extracted the water or you have pr produced the cryogens, you can actually store them in these cold areas and they'll stay stable for long periods of time. You can also use the robots to begin to assemble the outpost. This is, uh, would be involve both teleoperated uh, machines to build things, but also we can use 3D printers to use local materials to build a lot of the structures we would need at the outpost using robots controlled from the Earth. In phase four, people return to the moon, moving into a largely assembled and fully operational outpost. So you can actually use these robots to create that capability and create a turnkey operation. Now phase five, when you start producing enough propellant that you actually are producing more propellant than you're using to get to and from the moon, I call that the break-even point. At that point, you can, you can export propellant from the moon and use it for any other, a variety of other purposes. And what I have in mind specifically is a transportation system that can access any point in cislunar space. And cislunar space basically consists of the zone of space between Earth and moon, but I, ex I expand that definition a little bit to include the libration points, both the Earth-moon libration points and the Earth-Sun libration points. The Earth-Sun L1 and L2 points are 1.5 million kilometers in fr uh, toward the Sun and away from the Sun, respectively. The Earth-Moon libration points are 60,000 kilometers above the center of the front side and uh, the far side. And all of these different points in space have their use, either as an observation platform, as a staging area for deep space missions, or for other purposes. And by building a system that can routinely access the moon and use machines to harvest the water that is present at the lunar poles, you can fuel this transportation system. So what are we doing? We're moving away from a system that's based primarily around rocket launch and discarding of assets to building a system where the assets are permanently based in space and they're refurbished and used continuously and for long periods of time. Effectively, you're creating a transcontinental railroad in space, one that connects the Earth with all the points of cislunar space, not just the moon, but all the points in between where all of our national scientific, economic, and national security satellite assets reside. So effectively, I'm talking about a change in the paradigm of space flight, all based on the use of what we find on the moon. So I think that uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Kraft Erika, who is a member of the Pinamundi group with Von Braun, and he said at, uh, at the Lunar Base Conference back in 1984, if God wanted man to become a spacefaring species, he would have given him a moon. And that's a very good way to summarize it. Because the moon is close and it's useful, we can actually use it to create new spacefaring capabilities, something that we didn't really know was possible until just recently with the discovery of the microenvironments of the poles and the deposits there that allow us to uh, create this new capability. Thank you very much. I have time for one very quick question for Paul. Anyone has one? Yes. Can you say more about using local materials for 3D printing? Yes. Uh, the moon is covered by a layer of particulate debris, regolith. It's ground up, basically ground up rock, in addition to glass that's been made by micrometeorite impacts. All of those can be used to, in, to fuse into an adobe like material using microwave energy. Or, or create ceramics by actually melting it using solar thermal. But uh, there have been experiments done with lunar particulate material to actually build, make additive structures using uh, a 3D printer technique. And uh, that's an interesting, it's, it's in its infancy, but it's being looked at seriously, especially by the Europeans who have uh, tried, who adapted this concept to their moon village idea. Thank you very much.